So welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna uh, get going with the introductions and maybe a few people will trickle in. And just to let everybody know that this, this will be recorded uh, and it'll be available both on IBP's website uh, and I'll put the link to that in the chat. And we also have a YouTube channel and it'll be uh, available there as well. So this webinar is part of a monthly series of webinars about um, bird banding and bird ecology, uh, mostly centered around bird banding that are, are sponsored by the Institute for Bird Populations and the Western Bird Banding Association and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and we've had a, a great response from Mosey collaborators and other people that are bird banding in Latin America um, wanting to share some of the work we're doing. So we're very excited today to have um, Alan Monroy present. Um, Alan is an ornithologist and natural resources management specialist and director of the Kiakari Bird Observatory. Um, during his career, he's worked in numerous conservation research programs for wild birds in Mexico, the US, Canada, Costa Rica, and Germany. He is a NAPC certified master bander and a member of the World Commission on Natural Protected Areas of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And he served as an expert for world, for world heritage sites and contributes to updating the IUCN red list of species. Um, he's participated in the writing of seven books on Mexican natural history, and he's published nearly 20 scientific articles. He's also a nature illustrator, a bio builder, a permaculture practitioner, and a yoga enthusiast. And um, if we have time, uh, and we're not, uh, our, if, if we have time after the presentation, I'll, um, Alan is going to lead a small yoga session in between the English and Spanish uh, portions of the presentation. And as you may have seen from the email, um, we are going to have this in Spanish. Vamos a presentar el webinar en español a las bueno a las a las cinco de la tarde donde vivo yo en una hora. Entonces, si quiere ver la presentación en español, pueden esperar una hora. Okay, Alan, thank you very much and uh, take it away. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I'll try to do my best uh, speaking in English, doing this presentation for you. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to listen to this, uh, to the talk that I'm going to share with you. Uh, I hope you can see there my, my presentation. If yes, I'm gonna start. Okay. Oh, good. Go ahead. Okay. Well, <clears throat> today I want to share with you the story of my banding station, Kiyokari Bird Observatory. Um, it is not going, only going to be about birds. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history and the background beh be behind this project. Uh, first of all, uh, I, this banding station is located in Jico, in the municipal, municipality of Jico, Veracruz, which is exactly here. I have uh, this uh, orographic map of Mexico, and you can see here that here in, in Jico, where I live, it's the foothills of, of the mountains, of the higher elevations here in Mexico, but all these foothills, oh, sorry, are uh, represent like a very important or one of the most important corridors for bird migration in the entire world. So this is the place where I live. It is a cloud forest type of vegetation. I am not already originally from here. I was born in the center of Mexico in the in Guanajuato state. But I always wanted to live in a, in a place with a lot of birds and a lot of uh, forests. So in 2016, uh, me and my wife wanted to, to buy a piece of land uh, so we could live and live completely out of the grid. So we were looking and we found like a beautiful piece of forest, cloud forest, which is an endangered ecosystem here in Mexico. And we bought this piece of land we would, because we wanted to preserve the forest. We also wanted to restore some habitat that was in the past um, uh, cattle land. And we also wanted to produce our own food because we understand that not only having protected areas is the way to preserve birds or nature, 
but we also need to change our way or the way that we uh, relate to with nature in this case with our food so we bought this land to have this permacultural project we start doing uh, the house all the construction of the the property and everything that we did here was with natural material um, here, the house was done with the stone from the place. It was done with uh, straw bale, with clay, with wood. So we wanted that all this project was a reflection of our uh, commitment to change the things that we didn't like in the world. Like we knew that construction has a lot of uh, ecological footprint and everything translates in a, in a way in, in bird, bird uh, survivorship. So we start building everything with natural materials to have the lowest impact in the land. Uh, we also have brought a lot of friends and a lot of students to our property that they have helped us to build the land. Here, is where, here in this picture, we were building the house. These are the straw bale, we were putting the clay. Here, I, I was working with bamboo, with other uh, constructions that we did. So we tried that everything has the lowest impact in the land. So, so uh, cloud forest can still survive. And also all the birds that live uh, there in the cloud forest. Um, we also produce our own food or pa uh, part of it. We want to increase every, every year the amount of food that we produce. We have our own chicken. We have um, worms that compost our food. We produce mushrooms. We, we compost everything in, in our food. Also, we have a, what we call a dry toilets. That means that they don't waste the water and that we compost all of our uh, uh, shit, if that's <laughs> proper to say. We produce part of our food and we are, we believe that permaculture is an important or a super important way of nature conservation. A lot of people talk about the strategies of protected areas, uh, protecting uh, um, endangered species, but there is not much attention on the impact or the, uh, that our food consumption has on bird survivorship. So we have everything that in mind because we also want to live healthier in, in a better relationship with our environment. <clears throat> Here is not only a place in, in our land for uh, bird research or, bird con or nature conservation. We also do yoga and nature reconnection retreats because we also understand that uh, all the a climate crisis and all the species crisis is not a biological problem, but it's, it is a social problem. And it is a strong problem of disconnection of the modern society with nature. So through yoga, through the local indigenous traditions from Mexico, we try, we do retreats, we do, we do trainings so people can uh, become yoga practitioners, yoga teachers, but also uh, all, all the yoga trainings that we do, it has a strong uh, topic of nature conservation, ecological footprint, uh, everything related because, well, we, we have this a very strong uh, yoga uh, part of our project because my, my wife, she's a yoga instructor. So we mixed our passions in, in her case, yoga, and in my case, nature. So we made this uh, experience for people local and, and also for foreigners, so they can experience nature in different ways. And not all, only talk about conservation to biologists, because I mean, biologists are already convinced that there is a problem, but there is a larger audience of local people, of people from the yoga community, that are very uh, willing to hear about or to participate in, in this kind of projects of nature conservation and that they can take back to their homes too. So 
besides uh, all the bioconstruction, permaculture, and yoga training, I am a, a researcher, a bird researcher. I have had the opportunity to, to uh, be a volunteer with IBP in California, in Sequoia and Kings Canyon. I have the opportunity to be banding at Tortuguero in several places in Mexico. I certified uh, as a master bander, as Steve mentioned, with Manuel Groselet. I am very proud to say that Manuel Groselet, a very famous uh, bander for, from France that li lives here in Mexico, he's my teacher. So all these years I have had very good teachers and I, of course, wanted to start a bird research uh, station at my property because as I mentioned earlier, uh, where I live is one of the most important corridors for birds in the entire world. It is very famous for the raptor migration that occurs uh, a, li a little bit lower in the lowlands, but in my house you can see uh, also large movements of uh, raptor migration. But it is not only raptors, we have a lot of warbler migration, many, many, many birds. So. Uh, it is like a super good place to, to do bird uh, uh, migration monitoring and also bird uh, winter survival monitoring because many of the migrants stay all the winter here, which in, in some species can be uh, eight months that they stay in, in, in these lands uh, before coming back to the US or Canada to breed. So, I start making like a bird a list of the species of the property. The property in itself is five hectares long. It's not that big, but it's a very good amount to preserve. And of course, what we want to do is to expand not only our property, but the, the, the nature projects with, with our neighbors. So we increase the amount of cloud forest that is protected for the local and also the migratory species. And here are some of the emblematic migratory species that we uh, have um, every fall, every spring, and also in winter. We have in the spring, uh, golden wing warblers passing by, uh, blue wing, Canada warbler, chestnut sided, black burnian, warbler, a wood thrush, a black bill cuckoo, yellow bill cuckoo. So of the 2,020 species that I have recorded in the site, in these five hectares, uh, almost 45% um, of the species are migratory. Not only from the north, we also have a species migrating to breed here and coming back to, to the southern hemisphere uh, on winter. So I know these species have some degree of concern, conservation concern, because their population has gone lower. So for me, it has been very important to restore and to preserve the, the forest that we, the, that we have for these species, because they, we have them every migration. And also, it is a very important place for endemic and resident species. 55% of them are uh, resident. This one, this uh, hummingbird here in my hand, is, is, this is an endemic species from Mexico. This is the bumblebee hummingbird. It's one of the smallest hummingbird in the entire world. And every day it is, uh, I hear it in my garden. I, I put the special flowers for it and it is coming every, every day. We also have golden brown warbler, uh, this is the hooded yellow throat, another endemic species of Mexico. We have it. I have it in my garden. I don't see it every day, but uh, every week I, I see at least one. So they are around. We have amethyst throated hummingbird, uh, I, black cap nightingale thrush. I think that that's the name in English. This is the blue. Blue crown mud mud, which is also another endemic species of Mexico. I have it in my garden. And another interesting species, such as the color forest falcon. So every day I have a lot of fun in my garden, bird watching. Uh, 
during migration, I can have more than 110 species in my garden with no problem. So it's like a, when, when I bought the, the land, I was not sure it was going to be so many birds, but uh, after, uh, after five years of uh, having the land, uh, I realized that it is much more important than I originally thought. And for this reason, and with my experience in bird banding uh, and in partnership with IBP, uh, I started a MOSI station in 2018 uh, because I wanted to, to see what birds were staying, what birds uh, were leaving, uh, what birds were returning every winter. All the, all the information that a MOSI station can provide. So I was very curious about it and that's why I started it. Also, I want to mention that Tierra de Aves, an organization from Mexico, is also helping me with materials, with tools. Uh, IBP also provided me with some of the pliers, uh, 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 rulers, et cetera, et cetera. So with this equipment that IBP and other organizations have provided me, I started the, the, the banding station. And I, I, I am not only interested right now on the migratory species, I also have like a special uh, little projects. One of them is about the hooded yellow throat. As I mentioned, it has a year round presence at the site. It's an endemic species of Mexico. And there is no research on their wing mold pattern. So I am uh, targeting this species. So far, I only have had only uh, adult male uh, occurrences in my nets, but I have seen females and, and immatures in the field. So in the, in the next years, I'm gonna be focusing more on this species to, to describe uh, fully it, its wing mold uh, pattern. This is one of the small projects there. Another project that I have is uh, re, uh, doing research with the local American dipper that we have in the, in the creeks. And for me, this is a very important species because this is a bioindicator of the watershed ecosystemic integrity. They don't like uh, dirt uh, rivers. So for me, it's very important that this species remains. So we, it, it is an indicator of that the river that flows in the, in the property is clean. This is a very poorly studied species in Mexico. I know that in the US and in Canada, they have longer and more research on the species, but here in Mexico is not, is not, is not very well known. And I have seen that there are many breeding couples in the area. I, I first uh, banded a couple of them, put them a, a color ring. And it was two years ago and to, to date, I still see the couple living in the, in the creek from the property. So I'm glad that the, this, these years, it has been a good space for, for them to try. So I'm gonna be uh, studying how many couples, how many uh, breeding couples live in the area, where do the chicks go, etc., etc. So uh, this is another species that I would like to pay more attention um, in the in the researches that we are doing. And of course, we have have, we have done several training workshops to increase the or to build the capacity of several uh, field technicians and biologists from Mexico and also foreigners. Here is uh, here here I am uh, in the picture and next to me is Manuel Groselet. We try to make the workshops together. Um, we are right now uh, teaching the. Uh, WRP uh, aging system because it's, it, it makes more sense in the tropics where I live. And we also partner with local uh, uh, government environmental ag agencies because we want to make more synergy uh, 
uh, or better efforts to preserve the birds and the cloud forest from, from here. Uh, so we have had uh, biologists from all over Mexico, from Brazil, from Central America, from the U US taking our uh, workshops. The workshops that we have done have been in Spanish, but in the near future, we are planning to make them uh, in Spanish and others is only in English, just to receive or mainly to target uh, foreign uh, banders that want to learn from the tropics. Um, so it is a lot of fun in the tr in the training workshops because we had the opportunity to ban migratory species, local species. In one of the trainings, we set the long longevity record of the golden crown warbler. We discovered some new parasites of local bird species. We have had a winter fidelity of uh, Wilson's warbler. So we are uh, little by little starting to discover uh, interesting things of the birds that are passing in, in Veracruz or that are staying for winter. And as I mentioned, uh, we are going to be doing uh, international bird banding trainings and band, uh, banding camps. Um, we, al we already have like uh, tents and the space to receive people for the workshops. Uh, it, it's going to be one month uh, camps um, and normally the bird banding trainings are one week, one week long and also we have done some uh, banding certifications for people that want to have the North American Banding Council certificate of a bander or a master bander. So we not only try to produce information, but we also try to, to build the capacities of the Mexican field technicians. So we have better level of bird banding all over the country, because in the future, in, not in the future, in the past, we have seen some uh, local efforts of banding, but that have not the best techniques and that still use the Humphrey Park system and this and that. So we want to have a more uh, homogeneous level, a very good homogeneous level all over Mexico, comparing to, to the level of the banders in the US or Canada. Uh, and also I want to mention, mention that this eagle, this is a black hawk eagle, this is one of the last treasures that I have the opportunity to help. I got the call of a person that told me that they had the eagle uh, in Northern Veracruz. And this is a super rare endangered uh, species in Mexico. It has a long distribution to South America, but here in Mexico is very endangered. So at the Kekari Bird Station, and in partner with uh, some friends that uh, have a rehabilitation center, we are taking care of this eagle with the objective of releasing it back to, to nature. We don't want to keep it as a, as a pet or in a zoo. We want to release it back. Now it's in a process of rehabilitation of the muscles uh, of the pectoral so it can fly again. It's in good uh, health conditions. So it's, it's doing very well. And this is one of the things that I have the opportunity to, to work with while having the Kekari Bird Observatory. And another thing that we are doing at the station, uh, I am also a, a scientific illustrator. So to have a better outreach with the local people, I am slowly making a a field guide of the birds of Hiko, but it's not a very small field guide. As I, as I mentioned, it, it has, in, in my place, I have more than 220 species, so it's not going to be very small, the field guide, but it will help a lot uh, to engage the local people with the, with the birds that uh, live in the place. Um, and yes, this is for me like a, a way to be creative, to develop my, 
let's say my skills with paintings and also sharing my passion passion for birds with the local people because in the end what I want is that the habitat not only is preserved but increase and the uh, systems of production of food become better and in alliance or stay with the with bird conservation because I am very sure that it is not the solution for bird conservation is not only natural protected areas as I mentioned it, it, it is a whole complex situation that we need to target and to change our uh, normal habits of living to a better sustainable way of living. Another thing that we have done a lot is that all the people that come, we make a lot of awareness that our cats always stay inside the house. Cats are the uh, second uh, cause of death, according to several studies. And another thing that you cannot see very well it, that in all our windows, we put uh, the stamps that uh, reflect UV light. So we have no uh, bird mortality with the windows because as I mentioned, our house is in the middle of the forest. At the beginning, the first month that we didn't have the stamps, we had some uh, mortality uh, um, birds, see some, some mortalities that occur. So I put in all the windows these stamps, and it always helped me to show the other people that, that the two main results of bird mortality, which are windows and cats, we 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 can handle them in an easy way in our house, and and this is an example for other local people that can do the same. And yeah. Our garden is for the birds. Uh, the birds, like the black phoebe, help us with the pests in the garden. So we try to make a balance and a synergy between the birds and all the species that live in the garden. So we are in balance with nature. And yep, uh, I don't know if I went very, very fast, but I wanted to thanks for, for your attention. This is a, a summary of all the things that we do here. We are uh, very happy to receive uh, people in the future that comes from the US or from Europe uh, or whatever, Central America, Latin America, to receive people here so they can do uh, activities such as bird banding, but not also not only bird banding, we will be doing bioconstruction. We need to make a proper field station for, for our research. Right now, I, I just put a table in the forest and I do the banding there, but I want to build a future infrastructure, infrastructure for, the, for the station. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank all the people that have helped us in these years. Uh, also, I uh, thank for Manuel Groselet. He's also doing a camp, a banding camp in the coast in the next months. So there are some very good opportunities here in Mexico to, to band and also to learn, to know uh, the local species for sure, to learn Spanish, why not? And to eat healthy and no, uh, no other experiences that are occurring uh, in Mexico. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. We are always all open to receive new people. And also if you have a uh, idea of funding opportunities, we are also welcome, welcoming that. So thank you very much. I, I open this space if you have uh, questions. Thank you so much, Alan. That, that was fantastic. Um, I can't believe all the stuff you guys are doing there. It's so impressive. Um, and just integrating all the conservation into like a full lifestyle approach is really one. It's really wonderful. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can, I think we're a small enough group that you can probably either just unmute and ask, or if you want, you can type it into the chat. Um, I know you guys haven't had the property that long, but um, have you, like in general, what, what are the impacts of, of climate change? Um, have you, what are you seeing from climate change effects on 
for it's down in Mexico. And it's such a topic of conversation up here in the States, but um, I, I really don't know about, much about what's going on in Mexico in that regard. Okay. Well, that's an important uh, question. And I, I'll try to make, I, I will try to answer with two examples. Um, one of the examples here is that the local people that have lived here for many generations, they all, they all talk about how the climate is changing because in the past, all the, all, the, all the day was cloudy with mist in the forest. Now you have more sunny days. So this is one of the reasons why this cloud forest is in danger because the conditions that this type of forest needs to, to survive are very specific and depend on the, the humidity that comes from the ocean. So with, with climate change, the old people say how it is different from a from couple of decades ago. So species like the wolf, bir uh, the bearded wood partridge, which is an endemic, I, I see how it is uh, suffering from it with the loss of the, pre the precipitation and this and that. This is, this is one example of that. And the second example that I wanted to mention is that I, besides this project, I also do neotropical eagle research uh, uh, in Southern Mexico, in the jungles of Mexico. And I have seen how the hurricanes uh, strength has increased in the years. And I see how they, uh, how do you say? Uh, not cut, but made the, tr the, the tree nest fall of the eagles. So for me, that is a clear example how climate change is affecting endangered species like the eagles, because several uh, nests that I was monitoring, they fell down because of the strong winds. And also another thing that I have seen is that the, the bark beetles are, the population of bark beetles are increasing and killing uh, some pine forests where the eagles nest. So that's another example for me how climate change can increase the population of beetles and that have uh, influence in other bird species. So I don't know if I answer your question, but that's two examples that I see here that how climate change is uh, starting to make these uh, noticeable changes. Great, thank you. Yes, you, you did answer it. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Alan? Arvin, go ahead. Hey, Arvin. Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well. How are Good. you? Hey, Alan. Good to see you. Hola, Arvin. Como estas? Bien, bien. <laughs> Muy bien. Hey, I wanted to ask you, in the area where you live there, is the surrounding landscape mostly forested or mostly deforested? And have you been noticing any trends in that since you've been there? Okay. Mm, well, I would say 50-50. 50% of the land has cattle and the other 50% has either forest or coffee, uh, shaded coffee. So what I have been doing is partnering with other uh, property owners that are mine, how, how do you say? S uh, similar minded so to make to create a partnership of a uh, private uh, land owners that want conservation but i am also working with coffee uh, producers so they keep producing their coffee but because the coffee plantations are super super good for migratory species you you see more migratory species in the coffee plantations in the shaded coffee plantations compared to the cloud forest. So we have been working to make a label, like a bird friendly production. So they keep preserve the way of uh, producing coffee because if they uh, stop producing coffee, what they change is to cattle. So we don't want cattle, what more cattle. So for me, it's clear that you cannot just talk about conservation of cloud forest, you, you need to and uh, promote that type of production that people know, people like, and it's good for birds too. 
Great, thanks, Alan. Gracias, Good Darwin. Luck. Good luck, keep it up. Gracias, Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Alan. That, that was fantastic. I, I know a lot of people are going to see um, the recording of it that we're going to, again, post on our website. Um, I'll, put the, I'll put the address here in the chat in just a little bit. Um, and if you want to brush up on your Spanish, you can stick around. In about 20 minutes, Alan's going to give a presentation again in Spanish. So. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for all the yes. people that came. And thank you for all the efforts that you all are doing in your in your sites. I oh, also have a lot of inspiration from all of you. Thanks, Alan. Actually, we do have one more question um, from Victor. He says, um, what is it like uh, having to work and live in your own reserve? <laughs> well, I would say it's one of the best decisions that I have made in my life. I didn't mention, but we don't have electric light. We don't have internet in the property. And we did it on purpose. We want to be disconnected from the matrix. Everybody is addicted right now. I include myself to, to the cell phone. So for, for me, living out of the grid is part of that reconnection to nature. And I feel, I feel better physically, emotionally, spiritu spiritually. So I, 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 I was born in a, in a city and I quit that and went, went to the forest. And I, I don't think that's an option for everybody, but I, I think we all can really make the, the change happen, no? You don't, I don't consider myself like a rich person. I have work and for everything that I have. And I think it's possible to, to, to create the utopy where birds, forests, and humans can, can thrive in harmony, I think. That's fantastic, Alan. I don't know if this, this translates very well into Spanish, but in the US, we, we would say, you don't just walk the, you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. You're, yes. you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're living a lifestyle that is, you know, for your ideals. It's, it's really, uh, really admirable, everything you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I always like to, to share, and uh, for me, it's, I, I do not only do the, the conversation, I also try to do the conservation. <laughs> there you go. That's a great way of saying it too. 